Two years into the pandemic, the COVID-19 is still wreaking havoc around the globe. Currently, we have 300 million cases around the world and 5.5 million deaths. Many countries and regions are still struggling to find solutions to deal with these new outbreaks this winter. And just a few days ago, the United States hit a global record. One million reported cases in a day. How is that even possible? So today, I invited a guest, a political activist from the United States to tell us more about the COVID situation in the US. Welcome to Talk It Out. I'm Li Jingxing. Joining me today is Sarah Flounders from New Jersey. Sarah is the co-director of International Action Center. As a political activist for over 50 years, she has organized solidarity delegations to countries that have been devastated by U.S. wars and sanctions, such as Iran, Iraq, Syria, Cuba, and Venezuela. She is also the co-editor of Workers World newspaper. She co-authored over 10 books. And her latest book is called Capitalism on a Ventilator, The Impact of COVID-19 in China and the U.S. So, Sarah, welcome to the show and also congratulations to your new book. We're very glad that as of today, it uh, is uh, there's a Chinese translation. It is published in China. Uh, so before we talk about your book, I remember just at the end of last month, you texted me and you said, I tested positive for COVID-19. So it was quite shocking to me as well. Um, so, I mean, I'm wondering, how are you feeling now? Are you feeling any better? I'm, I'm feeling better, not all better. I've, I've certainly turned the corner on it, but uh, it's a little over three weeks now, and I'm still highly congested. I have uh, extreme headaches and vertigo and, and things like that. But, um, you know, this is a, it's a nasty virus. It hangs on. You know, it does different things in your system. But it's not for me. I am vaccinated. I had the booster shot. Uh, so I, I think it's not as severe as as it is for people who have no protection. Mm. So you took two vaccines, you took the booster shots, and you, you took all precautions, but you still infected with COVID-19? How, how is that possible? The implications of it are what to me is frightening, because it means that this virus has evolved uh, to where it is so highly contagious and it's able to break through the vaccines. Now, it's true, the Omicron, not as serious, not as deadly if you're vaccinated and so on, but it, viruses evolve constantly, constantly. So now we know that the virus can break through the vaccines. No protections are being taken. It will mutate further. Will it mutate in an even more dangerous direction? I don't know. So, mm. and, and so many of the people who are sick are people who are vaccinated and they're simply told, oh, don't worry, you won't die of it. So, you know, it means that whole parts of the country are really shut down of, because people are unable to work. I mean, a million infections a day you, you can't uh, even comprehend what that means. And yet mm. business goes on as usual. It, it is, uh, I think, stunning. We, we didn't expect this. And uh, of course, when I tested positive, I was in a rage. I, I really was. <laughs> and uh, if anything, it fueled more um, this this anger at the, the way in which... Uh, this virus has been dealt with or not dealt with, mm. almost ignored, almost ignored. Mm. Apparently you got three shots, but you, I remember you told me in the text that you feel severe pain, your body, your head. It sounds like the symptoms were still pretty strong. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, not so. My oxygen level was all right. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't end up, you know, uh, needing oxygen, uh, respirator, mm. ventilator. That's all to the good. Um, so my fever didn't spike. That, that's important. Um, so, but at the same time, 
this was no joke. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was feeling pretty sick. Mm. Uh, mm. And I, I think that is what, by simply saying, oh, this isn't so serious. And, and uh, they've even changed the quarantine, uh, you know, the isolation times. It was two weeks and it was 10 days. Now they say five days. Now they say, well, if you don't have symptoms, just come back to work. You know, the directions that people are being given and, and being expected to work even when they're not well is also, mm. um, you know, really, this is not a, an approach to medicine or to health care. You wrote uh, several articles uh, criticizing the whole response of U.S. government and U.S. healthcare system in dealing with this whole pandemic. Um, so, so what's what's your observation? How did the whole healthcare system or the government failed to really help the people who needed the help? Well, there is no public health system in the United States today. I mean that doesn't exist. There is no coordination. That's a problem. So even in the vaccine rollout between cities and states and counties and how it was being distributed and where and where you could go for a vaccine, complete uncoordination. Uh, and this was true in the early measures of every, every state had its own rule. And then Every city had its own rule and different counties had rules on whether to wear masks or not. Uh, what were the mandates completely changing and chaotic? So the lack of any measure of coordination and at the same time, an insistence that the solutions be in the hands of private corporations in areas where they could make a profit. So. Even the tests, China immediately developed a test, told the whole world how to make it. Countries started making it. The United States did not use those tests until another test rolled out, which turned out to be a disaster. And then still another one that that one corporations could sell at a profit to the government to be distributed. So from the beginning, the rollout of testing was completely chaotic and profit driven. All different corporations and the testing done through all different private corporate labs. Uh, and then the same thing happening with the vaccines. The hospitals operate in the same way. Every service is contracted out to different competing, not even using the same software. I, I mean, it is difficult to even describe at what level when there is not coordination. Uh, now, uh, just to give a comparison, there is coordination in the repressive apparatus in the U.S. You know, they can run your fingerprints and come back with, with a match or come back or, or an iris scan uh, within about three minutes. But you know, sending in tests even to the CDC and getting counts and numbers, 10 days we're talking in the beginning, or even now the um, antigen tests, you know, testing for variants is hardly done uh, in the United States compared to other countries. So when countries announce a new variant, it's as if it came from there. And so when, when South Africa announced the Omicron uh, variant, the response was similar to what it had been to China. It was a racist response, and it was to block all flights coming from South Africa, even though the next day Europe announced that the Omicron was everywhere, but they didn't block flights from Europe. So it became known as a South African variant. Uh, with a really a, a racist uh, tinge to the whole reporting and description. It was because South Africa was testing for variants. Uh, the United States was hardly doing that. And the between sending the tests and it being measured was a 10-day wait. So that's very slow when you're talking about viruses. I, I don't want to get too technical here, but... Um, 
these are the real problems when you have no coordination, not enough mm. testing, and it's all being done by just a hodgepodge of different um, companies, uh, each mm. operating on a for-profit basis. So <clears throat> it, it, it's the same thing with how every doctor, I mean, the doctors and medical staff, they care desperately. They're trying to give the best care they can. But the, the hospitals, there's actually a lot of hospital shutdowns because they can't operate at a profit in this environment. So they simply have to fold. Now, that seems hard to even comprehend how that could happen. But uh, that's the reality in where everything, everything is organized to make a profit or not. That's the first measure. The same mm -hmm. things happen on the drive to open restaurants and businesses. And also, you earlier you mentioned you think there's a lack of coordinations in the United States that led to this this epic fail, this this a huge outbreak of pandemic. I mean, what's the situation? Uh, what's it like in the United States now? Are there any? Um, restrictions or measures to reduce the movement of people, reduce gatherings, just, just, to, just to reduce the infections at, at least a little bit. So is there any measures that you think uh, different states, different cities are taking that are useful? Well, there's certainly lecturing to reduce it. But in practice, when restaurants and businesses uh, stay open, uh, when airlines can book tickets and people can go anywhere, and the airlines can't fly because so many people are sick. I mean, 1,500 cancellations of flights, that leads a lot of chaos at the airport. I mean, there you have thousands of people packed together. That can't be healthy. <clears throat> so. And I just want to say my own experience and even trying to get tested for COVID, um, you know, there, there were just hundreds of COVID testing sites because any lab could set up, you could set up a, a card table uh, and, and do tests. You get paid for every one of them. Uh, but as soon as there was an outbreak, they, they couldn't keep any of those situations staffed. So we stood in line for hours in the freezing cold. And then uh, there was only one, one person operating this, this uh, clinic that should have had many, many people. Everybody else had called in sick. Uh, we, we went to another place and stood in line that stretched out to the highway um, and then turned out that it wasn't open. They hadn't notified anyone. There wasn't even a sign on the door. Uh, went to a, you know, a third place. I'm just describing my own experience in trying to get a test. So, and I'm not the only one. I mean, I, I, I see how long the lines are uh, and how difficult the testing is. We're standing in line with a COVID test. We're standing in line. We have an order number. I was told to stand in line and have an order number. I've tried for four days to get a COVID test. I'm a doctor. If I go into a hospital and I spread COVID everywhere, what are you going to do? When they say, a million people tested positive in a day. Uh, you think of all the people who just couldn't stand in line because they're seniors, because they're in nursing homes, because they're disabled, because they have kids at home, uh, you know. Uh, so, and by the way, this, this million testing positive does not count the, the rapid tests, the at-home tests that they give out uh, that, that, that doesn't get rolled into the uh, CDC count, uh, only the lab tests do. So uh, I can take a, a rapid test at home. I test positive. Who do I report it to? And I first oh. did take a rapid test at home, tested positive, knew I was sick. And yet, okay, I know, family knows, you know, uh, but there, there's no... There's no government collection of that data, no way of having any local 
agency or state or national that's gathering that. So that's another complete disconnect. Um, so that means even the one million global record of reported cases in a day is still under reporting. Big under reporting because these are the people wow. determined to stand in line and get tested. So uh, you can you can picture those who couldn't or those who uh, took the rapid test knew they were sick. Okay, they stayed home, hopefully, and. Now they have five, six days, no longer two weeks. <laughs> um, at any rate, that, that's, that's part this, this standing in line for care. Um, I tried to notify my doctor and uh, everyone in the office was out sick except for one doctor uh, who, you know, after quite some time was able to do a, um, a, a phone conference. But uh, she explained to me that the, um, you know, the uh, virus medication that had been available even two weeks before that was helpful in, uh, and, and for which I would qualify based on age and health conditions and so on, was no longer available because everything in medicine in the U.S. is done on what's called an on-time basis. You don't order anything until it's already a need. Now, this is what happened early on when there wasn't even masks, you know, uh, because there wasn't anything in stock. There wasn't anything on order. This, this just-in-time way of doing everything uh, means that you had hospital staff where they're using plastic garbage bags for cover and and you know, uh, shower caps and tying bandanas on their face. This is nurses in a hospital, um, mm. emergency room technicians. So anyway, these are the, the breakdowns that happen. And you, you think to yourself, how is that possible? Uh, you know, uh, well, why can't I reach a doctor when I need, to, uh, you know, to, to reach a doctor? Uh, and it's not that the doctors don't care, uh, but but they're operating in a system that is, you know, so so very uh, competitive and and broken down. Uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier because um, your new book, Capitalism on a Ventilator: The Impact of COVID nineteen in China and the U S. You actually wanted to publish the uh, English version of this book in the United States, but somehow it was taken down. The, the publishing houses in America refused to publish your book. Why? Uh, well, Amazon is about the largest uh, online distribution center. Uh, it, we were trying to publish at a time when most publishing houses, along with many things, were shut down. Uh, and so when we got this notice refusing unless we redrafted the book, changed the title, <laughs> you know, uh, and all of that. Um, uh, so what we did was we did a fundraising, found a small private printer who would print it and began our own distribution. Um, we, we tried, um, and this was a, a project of the International Action Center and the uh, China-U.S. Solidarity Network, uh, we even tried to advertise the book and were told by the largest, they, they simply send out media releases. They would not touch this topic. So mm. that to us was, it wasn't just an individual Amazon choice. This, this uh, comparison was not being allowed. Now, if we wanted to publish a book talking about China as authoritarian, saying their measures were terrible, uh, we'd have no trouble finding a publisher or finding funding. There is open access to funding on material that attacks China. The idea of learning from China, examining what they're doing. Uh, and, and this was the, the people who were writing these articles, we had 50 different authors who have campaigned, some of them for years, for uh, a public health 
free public health in the U.S., which is a very difficult campaign, as you can imagine. <clears throat> um, and other commentators uh, looking at what's going to be the impact. Now, these were people who in the past maybe had worked on why is the level of diabetes so high here and the level of, of uh, untreated heart conditions and whatnot. Uh, so they were looking at it through that lens also. They, they contributed articles uh, to the book. Mm. Anyway, uh, I'm just saying that, that, that uh, that kind of examination and comparison and critique is not allowed in the U.S., not allowed by the publishers, so, by the so advertisers. I mean, their, yeah, their problem is that you cannot, say, you cannot say China is doing a good job containing the virus, or you cannot compare. Just, uh, so <laughs> you cannot praise China. You, you, you can't compare zero COVID deaths to 800,000. No, 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 no. <laughs> that, that is uh, propaganda. That is, um, now they have lots of forms of propaganda that are completely allowed, uh, but this would not even be uh, permitted. So uh, that's true. We found a, a private uh, printer and were able to distribute um, some costs, sell some copies of the book, but not in any way uh, you know, what would be a normal book distribution route in the U.S. Mm. So, so much for freedom of the press. Uh, <laughs> That's what I want to ask, because we were told one of the most uh, proud, uh, like uh, the thing, one of the thing that Americans most proud of is the freedom of speech, freedom of press, right? So why they are not supporting you to publish this book? Well, you would think uh, it would be obvious and easy, but uh, it's not really even the way the corporate press operates. It's highly coordinated and they have a line that they take, they push it relentlessly and anything mm -hmm. that is opposed to that, of course, we found the same thing for years when the, the U.S. is a gross, aggressively mobilizing for a war and demonizing the targeted country. Anything that opposes that is simply not allowed in the mainstream media. Doesn't mean you can't make an individual flyer, um, but, uh, but any uh, possibility of it really being part of the mainstream discourse is barred. Mm. It's just cut off. So... Mm. I would say that the, 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 the people who are cooperating on how do we discuss COVID were um, folks who have dealt with uh, decades of restriction um, on not being able to discuss U.S. wars, U.S. sanctions. Now a third of the world, <laughs> the United States has sanctioned. And they've done the same thing with uh, countries' access to to uh, the COVID vaccines. If you're sanctioned, you don't get access even to the vaccines. So uh, we, we already knew that, that uh, there is this difficulty in challenging the official story. And the official story is always full of propaganda and assuring people that it's much worse somewhere else especially much worse in the country that's being targeted at that moment. Uh, so, like China. <laughs> right, China. Absolutely. Uh, 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 mm. They can't say China without saying authoritarian, uh, without uh, talking about the, the lack of uh, individual freedom and, and so on and, and so forth. So, um, and the government being all pervasive and there's no discussion even allowed of a, a very vibrant uh, grassroots and neighborhood, uh, you know, associations that exist. There's no understanding in the United States of that because what could you compare it to here that people have experience mm. with? That, mm. There isn't anything mm. to even make that description.
Like I, we've seen in the past few decades, the U.S. government and the military industrial complex were really trying to export the democracy, the, the system that America has. Even now, we still can, can hear how these candidates for president uh, were, were praising the, the system that the US, U.S. has and how it changed the American's life. I mean, you as an American citizen, do you feel this system will really help each individual that living in, in the United States to, to have a better life? Does, it, does all this democracy and freedom that the U.S. government was, was bragging about can really help every individual in the society? Democracy is a very hollow, hollow, empty word here. Uh, it really hardly exists. And this is understood, even by the average person, that it takes millions and millions of dollars to run for office. You have to be backed by big money. That's not democratic. Uh, and at the level of freedom yeah, you can be free to be homeless. You can be free to lose your job. There's all kinds of freedom uh, that, that we have here, but there's not free education. There's not free health care. Uh, actually, most young people are already deeply, deeply in debt, deeper in debt than their parents, just to pay for an education. So there's very little that's actually economically free or socially free, and yet the term freedom is used. The terms democracy and freedom are, are used, saluted, flag raised, but uh, whether it's a reality, I think there is an understanding that that isn't so. Uh, voter suppression is, is absolutely reality that's being passed through every state legislature, how to restrict, how to make sure less people vote, uh, how to cut people off the rolls, particularly black people, people of color. Uh, this, is, this is the reality. And actually, it's not challenged by the Democratic Party. It may be a policy of the Republican Party, but it's not really challenged because they also know it takes big money, uh, multi, multi-million dollars to, to run. Well, in the name of freedom and democracy uh, is also how the United States has fought one war after another. I mean, in my lifetime, the United States has never not been at war uh, in another country. And this is even more so true for, for young people today since 9-11, since, since 2001. Really, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria... Uh, massive wars of destruction and uh and and the soldiers who are sent to fight the, the rate of of suicide afterwards is higher than the fatalities when they were there uh because of the role that they played i think it it plagues them afterwards so but all this was done in the name of freedom and democracy the drone attacks that's freedom and democracy and so uh, that really means, uh, I, because the opposition to the war is really there. They do all kinds of polls, and no matter what, people don't want another war and don't believe in the wars. Now, that's important. It means that they're having more and more trouble selling their wars. They, they can call for, you know, uh, Biden has a, uh, a summit on democracy. <laughs> <laughs> who, who does he invite? <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's the dictatorships around the world. So, you know, it's, it's a political vehicle, but it's a very empty uh, term and it doesn't have much allegiance here. It does for the major politicians. You know, they, they can't operate, can't get a platform in the corporate media unless they all salute to freedom, democracy, and the flag. But uh, it, it doesn't mean it's a, it's a, um, it's a real policy. And, and no one really expects 
that in Afghanistan or in Iraq, they were bringing freedom or democracy. It was about corporate domination, control. Thank you so much for taking this interview when you are still sick. I really hope that you recover soon. Thank you so much, Sarah, for taking this time. Thank you.